I think when it comes to Avatar, there are a number of nigh-universally agreed rules. There is no movie in bossing say, I say anime, you say not an anime, and of course, The Great Divide is either the absolute worst thing to have ever been created, like seriously, it should be smited from existence, or it is the most underrated masterpiece ever made. And while I joke about The Great Divide, I think each person having their own little favorite side adventure in the series is one of the most beautiful things about Avatar that often tends to be overlooked in all the macro story discussions. I do think that the word underrated has very much lost its meaning nowadays. But I think The Deserter is genuinely underrated, and I say that not just because it gives one of the most quotable lines. You want to stop breathing? but also because it sheds a whole lot more light on the Fire Nation as a whole, something that is extremely rare up until Book 3. And on that note, I think it's important to sketch in the sort of cultural touchstones we had seen at this point in the series. Obviously, the most important part is that the series begins with the Firebenders starting this war. Just about every single antagonist up to this point, be it Zuko or Zhao or the Prison Warden or even the Sages, have all been Firebenders. As of now, there has been very, very little moral ambiguity, with the only notable examples being that singular Fire Sage, Roku, and Zuko under the guise of the Blue Spirits. But even with those examples, we see that for Zuko, it's just a means to an end. He still ends up trying to strike at Aang. Point being that, at this point in the series, the Fire Nation is presented as a mass of mostly just bad. And on the opposite side, we have the three other nations. The Southern Water Tribe is this secluded settlement just trying to get by, and is once again caught up in the conflict as Aang is discovered. But notably, it is just civilians. All the fighters are long, long gone. We then fly on over to the Southern Air Temple, and that too is completely decimated. Kyoshi Island, much like Wolf Cove, is entirely secluded, and despite having warriors, they just try to avoid the war altogether. Soon thereafter, we meet Hero and the Earthbenders, who, up until now, also had their spirits just entirely crushed. And right on the heels of that, we have the Winter Solstice, which solidifies all of that and supplants Ozai as the ultimate big bad. Every single culture, every single settlement, everything in this world has in some way been burned by the Fire Nation. And while there certainly are a few deeper layers of morality with the likes of Jets, as of now, the story does very much paint a pretty black and white story of Firebenders bad, all other benders very good. Fire is the element that consumes all. And that is precisely when we get to the Deserter. The episode that rocked so that the Avatar State, the Puppet Master, and potentially even Zuko's story in Book 3 could run. Right from the get-go, I think it's important to note that the title of Deserter immediately has a negative connotation to it. In the world of Avatar, deserting the Fire Nation is of course the biggest W possible, but purely conceptually, it is not a good thing. But very quickly, we learn that things are in fact a whole lot more complicated. The quote-unquote evil nation has good, and as we'd see later with General Fong and Hama, the quote-unquote good nations too are not entirely pure. But before we get to all the morality squabbles around the different nations, let us look back to the start of the episode because another super important thing that is established here is Aang's fear of firebending. We open with the gang seeing the posters for the festival, and while Katara and Sokka are a bit apprehensive about this whole thing, Aang insists that this would be a good opportunity to see very high-level firebending up close. This is that 12-year-old curious and joyous side of Aang, just wanting to see some cool tricks, banter around, and generally just have a good time. He obviously doesn't turn a blind eye to the brutality of the Fire Nation, but much like we saw in his conversation with Zuko, Aang remembers his friend Kuzan. He remembers the Fire Nation he knew before the war. He remembers the shenanigans that he and Gyatso got into. To him, Fire Nation or no Fire Nation, this is just a fun event with fun people. He's excited to learn, and he's excited to just see some interesting bending. But at the same time, very visually we are shown that there are two sides to every story, with Sokka then noticing the wanted posters on the other side of the notice board. Aang of course pulls a bit of a Luffy and is actually excited about his wanted poster. But I think the most important point in all of this is that it establishes a very clear point of reference as to how Aang views firebending, with him yet again just saying that he has to master firebending. Having spoken to Roku and at least somewhat come to terms with him running away, he wants to be the best avatar that he can be, and so, just like water and earth, firebending is simply a thing that he must learn. And it's of course not long until that curiosity is tarnished, but okay, let's not jump ahead. But another thing to note here is that alongside Aang's poster, there is also Zhang Zhang and Che, but importantly, both are still depicted with their topknots. 
Before I get into overanalyzing, the purely practical interpretation is that this is just their last known appearance and so that is what the poster depicts. You know, if you want to find someone, you're probably going to use the last known description, right? That said, in the wider lore of Avatar, and as we'd see with Zuko and Iroh, the top knots are an incredibly important sign of honor in the Fire Nation's culture. In the rise of Kyoshi, Jian Shu, I think that's how you say his name, I've got no idea, cut Rangi's top knots as an explicit threat. And of course, Zuko and Iroh cut it themselves as a symbol of them leaving the Fire Nation. So again, going back to that title of Deserter and the negative connotations around that, their posters still depicting them with their top knots, I think creates another interesting dichotomy of what desertion really means with something like the Fire Nation. Traditionally, you'd presume desertion to be a sign of cowardice or rebellion or something along those lines. Neither of which would likely translate into the deserting soldiers cutting their own top knots. I mean, chances are, if they desert, they hold mixed feelings about the Fire Nation as is, so their symbols of honor wouldn't apply to them either. But with Zhang Zhang and Che, their situation is much, much closer to that of Zuko and Iroh than it is to just some random soldier. Both deliberately abandon the style and let their hair hang loose. But okay, that is like definitely overanalyzing, the posters are literally just what the Fire Nation knows. It's really not that deep. Never forget that despite Kyoshi Island being literally the next episode, the Southern Air Temple still shows Kyoshi as just some random dude. As the gang begin exploring the festival, they go to pick up some masks. Again, the obvious reasoning here is, you know, the wanted posters within walking distance and probably plastered all over the place here as well. But this is a story, and more often than not, a wall is never just a wall and a mask is never just a mask. So much like with Zuko and the Blue Spirits, I think this whole mask thing may rather tie in with the metaphorical mask that Zhang Zhang wears and the hatred he feels for himself and his elements. Or more generally speaking, when everyone is masked, suddenly those lines between nations are blurred and even the Avatar can just calmly walk among these people. The Avatar is an important force, but at the same time, he is also just a person, not some mythological being. In a very roundabout way, sometimes the masks people wear actually reveal their true faces. Well, actually, I say that, but that's kind of a mixed bag, because they also see a low-key, actually kind of high-key, disturbing plague of the Fire Lord straight up burning the Earth Kingdom soldier. Which, number one, continues the trend of the Fire Lord being this horrific fire-breathing monster. Number two, depicts the indoctrination of the Fire Nation as even the kids just cheer at the plate, despite the, well, disturbing events. Something we'd see on full display with the Ember Island players. And finally, numero three, also reinforces that firebending comes from the breath angle we'd see many, many times throughout. But the most important thing here is, of course, the bender slash magician slash play slash trick dude. Much like with the posters and coming here in the first place, Aang is super excited to be called on stage. To him, all of this is just some good old bands, and his avatar duties are, well, let's say not at the top of his mind. Which also very nicely sets up for his own attempts at firebending later in the episode. I think there is definitely a degree of him wanting to be the avatar and learning the elements, but here, I think he kind of uses that as an excuse to just goof around. And speaking of, much to his disappointment, it is Katara who gets called up instead. The fire wizard magician man does his old dragon shtick, but he's a tad too convincing and Aang jumps in to stop it before it gets to Katara. But importantly, even now, there is no real tension. Clearly, Aang felt at least a little bit of fear that prompted him to jump in and blow their cover. But considering he immediately plays it off as just a goof, I wouldn't really say it's much more than, oh, might be bad, better help just in case, which again will feed into everything we see later. Aang is very confident in his airbending skills. I mean, his reaction to meeting Zuko is literally just... Well, you're just a teenager. On Kiyoshi Island, he freed himself basically instantly. In Imprisons, he got a little distracted by everything going on, which then gave us the legendary... Earthbending style! And of course, with Zhao... I've never hidden from you. Untie me and I'll fight you right now! Broadly speaking, Aang is very much an optimist and does often get a little bit overconfidence. A lot of the time, that confidence is warranted, as he really is an extremely proficient bender. But there are also times where that fun-loving and careless side of him yields some not-so-great results. Like we've seen with the Unagi, and like we'd also see here. A good old chase later, we find ourselves chatting around the campfire with Che, which, considering in the previous episode we had this exact kind of vibe with Bato, already begins to challenge those perceptions of all firebenders just being this massive antagonists. That said, he might not be a baddie, but he's definitely a bit of a liar. 
He's the first person ever to leave the army and live. Well, Che, I'll give you a pass because this isn't from the main series and maybe the Fire Nation simply never disclosed this, but the first deserter was actually Onomu. But okay, Che, maybe you really meant the first one to leave and live because we don't know Onomu's fate. Still kind of sus though. But okay, my goofiness aside, hearing that there is a master out there with zero ties to the Fire Lord, Aang is absolutely over the moon and wants to jump headfirst into training. Roku did tell him that he must master all the elements after all. And right from the get-go, it was clear that fire would be the hardest to even begin learning. This is a golden ticket. And on top of that, there's just Aang's natural openness to trying new things. So just like with the festival earlier, while Sokka might raise some very valid points of concern, Aang just wants to go with the flow and says that this is a one-of-a-kind deal. But of course, before they can arrive to any sort of decision, they are intercepted by the local tribe. This is one of those things that is touched on a tad later in the episode, but I've always wondered about this plot point of Zhang Zhang deliberately trying to push Aang away. Considering he'd explicitly bring up the cycle of the elements himself, my interpretation was always that he aimed to seek Aang out once Aang was actually ready. And I also remember reading very, very old forum posts about how originally Zhang Zhang was actually storyboarded to be Aang's firebending master. From what I remember, Zuko was just meant to switch sides and become an ally, but Zhang Zhang was actually meant to be the master. Obviously, take all of this with a huge grain of salt, as I can't for the life of me find any mentions of that anywhere, but it really makes me wonder what an alternate form of Book 3 might have looked like with Aang already having a true master ready to teach him. Definitely interesting to think about. But as much as we've met this ex-Fire Nation soldier and potentially a master to boot, there is still the opposite side to this entire conflict. Good ol' Admiral Zhao, who is already hot on their heels. Though before we follow up with his old pupil, his newest pupil goes to meet him, but right away, we see that he knows that Aang hasn't mastered water and earthbending, saying that the cycle cannot be broken. Avatar is very much one of those series that often conveys strength through wisdom, as opposed to just, well, raw strength. That's of course not to say that he isn't also an incredibly powerful bender. But this sort of stance of, you're not ready yet, just clues us into the fact that there is a whole lot more to this Avatar business than we know, and that there are benders who transcend their own nations. With Zhang Zhang, I do still think that not having any White Lotus Easter eggs here is a bit of a missed opportunity. But purely in the way that he speaks, it's clear that even the way he thinks about bending is drastically different to just a practical concern of having to learn it. And that continues as Aang blurts out that he is the Avatar and that it's his destiny to master the elements. Only for Zhang Zhang to then lecture him about him being a fish flowing down the river without the ability to even conceptualize what the ocean is. Basically, he just says that Aang has literally no clue what being the Avatar actually means. As far as Zhang Zhang's characterization goes, he along with Che and really the rest of this episode is pretty heavily inspired by Apocalypse Now or Heart of Darkness on which it is loosely based on. Zhang Zhang is a deserter disappointed in his nation who finds himself in the camp of a tribe and a fellow deserter. Cornel Kurtz didn't exactly desert the army, but definitely went against much of it. He also becomes a notable figure among the tribe, and there's also the photojournalist who seems to be oddly interested in Kurtz. The way those similarities play out are of course very very different, with Zhang Zhang not being consumed by that burning hatred that he'd later describe. But the inspirations are definitely there. Though something that I absolutely love here is Zhang Zhang's explanations of the other elements, much like Iroh would later teach Zuko. But what makes the scene all the greater is that I think it also functions as a description for the rest of Aang's journey. As of Book 1, Aang is a super whimsical, fun-loving, goofy little guy. Sometimes too much so. But water is cool and soothing. And so, by the end of Book 1, and especially after becoming the Koizilla, Aang does mellow out a little bit. He is obviously still just a goofy kid, but that head empty, no thoughts, big fish instinct is certainly toned down a little bit. Something that I think we see very explicitly with episodes like The Avatar State, Return to Omashu, The Swamp, and just about everything else post Book 1. But then, the challenges Aang faces just keep escalating and escalating, and so Aang must learn Earth. It is steady and stable, firm and resilient. Something we see on full display after Aang loses Appa, and even more so with the whole bossing Sei conflict. I mean, look at this scene right here. Looks pretty firm and resilient to me. And finally, there is fire. The element that has a life and mind of its own. Without control, it will grow and consume and consume until there is nothing left. Or, in other words, it is permanence and it is death. The final challenge Aang must face in his journey of becoming an avatar is not the element of fire itself, but rather what to do with Fire Lord Ozai. 
Ultimately, it is only through understanding the impossible power that he wields that he subdues Ozai with what is easily one of the most impressive bending maneuvers in the entire series. This is Aang facing fire face to face. But the scene does not end there, because as Zhang Zhang once again screams that Aang is not ready and that he is weak. You think I am weak, Avatar Roku? No, no! If you've seen any of my content before, you'll know very well that one of my absolute favorite parts of Avatar is the more mystical and unknown side of the spirit world. And this is exactly that. Fact of the matter is, we really have no idea what Roku's appearance here even is. One interpretation is that this is just a completely made up vision that Zhang Zhang has purely as a result of his hatred for firebending. The tree he sat beneath was just completely dead, but as Roku appears, it is back in bloom. But what does Roku do? He sets it ablaze as a threat, because that is what fire is. It is the element that consumes. Considering Aang's reaction to Zhang Zhang saying that he will train him is just... Really? That's great! It's pretty clear that all of this is happening purely from Zhang Zhang's perspective, and this isn't like Aang turning into Kyoshi or anything. So, if you want to look at this moment as this regretful and almost fearful interaction, I think it definitely makes sense. But my personal interpretation has always been that this is him actually peering into the spirit world in the same exact way that we see Iroh follow Roku's dragon during the solstice. Clearly, Zhang Zhang is a whole lot more spiritually attuned than the average bender. So, perhaps coming face to face with the Avatar is this super spiritual moment where he is really pushed to confront his feelings about his own elements. But whether you choose to interpret this as an actual spirit world interaction or just a moment of really volatile emotions for Zhang Zhang, I think what matters most here is that tree being set ablaze. It establishes that more somber side of firebending as opposed to purely overpowering destruction that we had seen thus far. In a way, I think you can look at Zhang Zhang as an almost alternate form of Zuko. Both have been, be it literally or metaphorically, burned by their own elements, and both are shaped by that pain. Only with Zuko, he turns that pain into anger and hatred. And firebending comes from the breath, not the muscles. Whereas Zhang Zhang really internalizes that pain. He is a master firebender, but in a way, he is afraid of fire. Which again, begins to fundamentally reshape how we view both the elements as well as firebenders as a whole. And that very nicely leads us into Aang's training, where the dominant emotion from Aang is just pure excitement. Zhang Zhang tells him that he must first concentrate and feel the sun, again pointing to that heightened mastery of the elements as firebending grows stronger during the day. From the winter solstice, Sozan's comets, and Aang's meeting with Roku in general, we already know that celestial events do in certain ways affect bending. But with Zhang Zhang and his pupil Zhao, it also creates this super stark contrast of Zhang Zhang stating that the sun exists in perfect balance with nature, whereas Zhao aims to completely eliminate the moon. More on that in a bit. But when it comes to Aang, I think a very interesting dimension here is that this sort of careless enthusiasm did allow him to leap ahead of Katara in terms of picking up waterbending basics. And in terms of airbending, his whole air scooter thing is also very, very whimsical. He is a monk, and that definitely comes with a certain degree of patience and focus, but in terms of bending, I think his approach is a whole lot more spontaneous. Which is also why I think we see him struggle with Earth. That is the element that grounds him. Are we coming up here so I don't burn anything with my fire blasts? Aang is a pacifist, so I think his perspective on bending as a whole can be a little naive. Look at his and Sokka's game of airball, for example. Obviously, Sokka is not a bender, and the game, you oh. know, kinda sorta doesn't work. And I think that is a really good showcase of how Aang doesn't really perceive the power that bending actually has. He has never seen airbending do any real harm, and with his few attempts at waterbending, they too were just messing around. And so, that is once again what he wants to do here. But to again contrast that, Zhang Zhang fires back. Get it? It's like, fires back because he's a firebender. It's fire, fires back. With him saying that firebending comes from the breath, and so he must first master proper breath control. The whole breath thing, of course, again connects to Iro and dragons, but it's again a matter of Aang just wanting to jump ahead a bit too much. To his credit, he does end up staying there for a couple of hours, but Zhang Zhang is still very much displeased. You want to stop breathing? And this is where we really begin to dive deeper into Zhang Zhang's thought process. He begins to talk about a student he once had. One who did not have the discipline or care for the power that he wielded, and only used it to destroy his enemies. And it's as Zhang Zhang says this that we pan on over to Zhao, who, without skipping a beat, sets the trees ablaze and just keeps going. 
with Zhang Zhang finishing his speech by saying that, with fire, you risk destroying yourself and everything you love. In a purely in-universe sense, I think you could tie this together with lightning bending. At the same time though, at this point in history, lightning generation was kind of an exclusively royal family type of deal, so I don't think he really knows about it. But then again, combustion benders and such also exist, and he is a member of the White Lotus after all. So he could know it, but just choose to never use it. But my point is that lightning generation can quite literally destroy you. Not in a metaphorical sense, but literally destroy you. If you choose to pursue this power of raw fire and do not respect it, you can very easily be just consumed by it. And more generally speaking, fire is passion and it is pride. Zhao, for example, is a firebender, sure, but really it's his temper that eventually leads to his downfall. He was a destructive man that was given destructive power. And so, he almost threw the world out of balance and destroyed himself in the process. And in the long run, the same of course goes for Ozai. Upon reflection, literally reflection by the way, very cheeky, Aang apologizes, saying that he'll try to be more patient. And so, he is given a new and very simple lesson. All he has to do is just stop this little leaf from burning up. And I think this right here is the perfect encapsulation of how Zhang Zhang views firebending. His first lesson is not how to make fire, or how to shape fire, or even how to protect himself from fire. No, it is just how to save the single leaf from said fire. He may wield arguably the most destructive element out of the bunch, but what you might notice is that his bending never actually leaves fires behind. In just a second, we'd see him conjure a massive firewall engulfing the entire river, but once it goes out, there's nothing, very clearly contrasting Zhao. He may wield fire, but he uses it with almost water-bending-like grace. But returning to Aang, despite Zhang Zhang's warnings, he decides to try making actual fire. And what I love here is the music in the scene, with this almost heartbeat-like sound constantly pulsing in the background. Aang, that's great, but you should take it slow. For the overwhelming majority of the series, Aang is the audience surrogate. But I think here, the direction plants us in the shoes of Katara. Aang is the one messing around and even after losing his balance, tries to replicate moves he's barely even seen once. But the sequence is not framed as anything goofy or adventurous or anything. No, there is an ease. Almost as if to tell us that some great taboo has already been broken. And a few seconds later... <laughs> and just like that, Aang is consumed by fire. This was not a fight with some bender, this was not just a training accident. No, he was warned time and time again. It was unintentional, sure, but he is the one who chose to ignore his master and his friend. These are the consequences. Much like he'd be terrified of the Avatar states, this is the thing that burns the danger of fire in his memory. And with Zhang Zhang, we see that point echoed once again, as he just immediately says that he already knows what happens. For him, this was inevitable. It doesn't matter whether it's Zhao or the Avatar. Fire consumes and destroys. The genius thing about this episode is that all of it challenges our perceptions of fire and the Fire Nation in many different forms. Fundamentally, it shows us that not all firebenders are the same. Not all firebenders would fall to the temptations of capturing the Avatar for some royal reward. And not all firebenders even wish to be firebenders. There are some like Zhang Zhang who hate the elements and envy Katara's healing. One who could use the overwhelming power of fire without ever burning so much as a single leaf. But there are also benders who indiscriminately destroy everything in their path. Ones blinded by rage and the all-consuming flame. And don't get me wrong, this isn't some world-changing observation, but considering this is a Nickelodeon show and this is still just book one, I think the deserter is the thing that sets the stage for the more morally dubious cases such as General Fong, the Dai Li, and of course, the Puppet Master. Evil and corruption exists in all nations, but so does good. Zhang Zhang is a true master, but he is burdened by the sins of his nation. Iroh comes to terms with that and shows humility, but Zhang Zhang hasn't forgiven himself. He was a high-ranking member. He has seen the brutality of war, and that fire still burns inside of him. He spends his days containing it, wishing and hoping that he'd never have to use it again. But at the same time, through Zhang Zhang, those perceptions are immediately challenged. His flames never consume, never burn, never even strike anyone. The close-up on Zhao shows us pure hatred, while Zhang Zhang shows sadness and regrets. Zhao pushes forward and burns. Zhang Zhang protects and flees. 
For Aang, on the other hand, this becomes an important learning moment that being the Avatar is more than just mastering the elements. He must understand them and wield them with the responsibility of the entire world. The Avatar state might be terrifying because he is not in control and the rage of all of his past lives takes over his body. But fire, fire might come from his hand, but it too has a life. One he might not be able to contain, no matter how strong he gets. He's an airbender and a monk. He wins his battles through avoidance and subduing his enemy. Fire is the direct opposite of that. It overwhelms through sheer force. If he ever wishes to master it, he must learn impossible restraints. But perhaps most of all, Aang's first time firebending continues to build up Ozai. I've made a whole video talking about the slow, slow burn that is the build up to Ozai. But this is one of the most defining moments in all of that. During the solstice, Aang learned of the Comet, of Ozai's strength, and he got a precise deadline by which he must master the elements. But on his first day of firebending, he burns Katara. He hurt her without even trying. And he, a 12-year-old kid barely having learned the basics of waterbending, will have to face the Fire Lord? His only chance of finding a master just evaporated in front of his eyes. But even ignoring that, he wants nothing to do with this kind of power. Why would he ever wield something so destructive ever again? But that is something he will have to face. The all-consuming force that is fire. A lot of discussions around the true maturity of Avatar, unsurprisingly, stem from mostly Book 2 and 3. But I think with how this episode explores those different avenues of what was supposed to be the quote-unquote bad elements, really tends to be overlooked when it comes to Book 1 episodes. There are other really introspective episodes like The Storm and The Blue Spirits. There are also episodes exploring the effects of the war on other nations, like Imprisoned or Bato. But this one is a beautiful mix of all of those things. What's even more surprising is that this is a Zhao episode without Zuko. So even with the secondary antagonist of the season, we have an entire episode exploring his past. And that, of course, eventually connects to the Siege on the North and even the library. So, yeah, the word underrated might be overrated, but if there is a book one episode that I think genuinely deserves the title of the most underrated episode, then I do think that it is the deserter. And that's the video. If you've made it here, let me spoil the surprise. Yes, all of these videos about Ozai and Aang's most important points of development leading up to their fight is leading up to the inevitable Aang vs Ozai video. So I hope you're looking forward to that. It's one I really want to get right, so we do still have a few tidbits to talk about before we get there. I've been mulling it over in my mind for many, many months now. And also, yes, as I suspect many of you will have already commented, the fact that Zhang Zhang was not in the Netflix version does make me high-key mad, but it is what it is. Anyway, with that, I want to say a massive thank you to our current patrons and YouTube members who allow me to produce even more of these for you all. Without you, there'd be a whole lot less of my ramblings, so seriously, thank you, thank you. Other than that, I want to say thank you very much for watching, I hope you have a great day, and hopefully, I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye!